Hello, hello, excellent students. Great to see you. Um, today, we're going to talk about the book of Job, part one, involving chapters one through 37 of the book, um, um, featuring uh, Job and Job's friends and the argument that they have about suffering. Um, I'm using um, two of these lectures to focus on the book of Job, a part one right now, and then also a part two, because First of all, because I just love the book of Job. Um, I find it to be a spectacular book. It's one of the most um, poetically engaging and moving and thoughtful um, meditations from the ancient world period, but certainly in the Bible, about the problem of evil and suffering uh, and pain and, and theodicy and all of these issues that we've been um, discussing throughout this series. I have a book that I wrote on the book of Job several years ago called Consider Leviathan, Na Narratives of Nature and the Self in Job. So I have a lot to say about Job, a lot of things in the book that I that I care about. Um, I also have some art professional scholarly articles on the book of Job. And so I have a lot to say about the book and I just can't, can't do it uh, in the time that we have. However, I want to laser focus the discussion um, in this two-part little mini-series within the lectures on Job on the problem of suffering in particular, and upon the way that it plays out uh, in the book. A little background on the book of Job, uh, um, part of the um, trio of, of wisdom books, also involving Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that we've examined in a different lecture. And um, Job is certainly the longest of these books, um, and it's the most complex. Scholars have a hard time with Job because it's just a tough book. One scholar described the book of Job, I think, very helpfully as, as like a big eel. <laughs> you try to grab it in your hands and it always slithers out. No matter where you grab it or how you grab it, it's like the other end is always going to get away from you. So it's very difficult to just be like, yep, I read the book of Job and I understand it perfectly and here's what it says and here's what it is. The end. You know, it's not that kind of book. Rather, it's the kind of book that invites a very thoughtful, prayerful living, long engagement with it, okay? So if you read Job or if you hear this explanation of parts of Job, um, which are, are offered, you know, tentatively from me, since I don't understand the book perfectly, and you don't feel like you fully grasp the book or understand really what's going on or what the conclusion is supposed to be, that's okay. That's par for the course. Indeed, if you've been tracking with these lectures and and and, you know, I can imagine a kind of a voice out there that might say, look, look, professor, I've been tracking with these lectures. I understand what's going on. I just don't like all the questions. You know, it just seems like question, question, question. What's this? What's this? What's this? Contradiction, issue, problem. What the heck? Um, I guess my brief response to you before getting into Job would just be, yeah, <laughs> this topic is like that. This topic isn't one where it's like, you know, this isn't a physics class or math, right? It's going to be like that. I mean, the problem of suffering and evil, the, the trilemma, the theodicy triangle with which we began this investigation is not something that's easily solved. If it was, we would just have a ready-made answer for all suffering for all time. You could write it in a little paragraph. You could put it on a, on a little business card and just hand it to people. Hand it to yourself, you know? Most of us, though, who have grown up a bit and, 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 been, and either been a part of suffering in, in our own bodies or selves or watched other people go through it and so on, know just instinctively that this problem isn't like that. And so I'll anticipate one of my final conclusions that we'll get to in one of the last lectures, if not the last one in this series. You know, this issue like, which one is the right theodicy? What's the answer here? Come on, let's have an answer. Well, okay, in a way, actually, don't, don't miss the fact that there have been little answers all along. I mean, the, the kind of Stoic theodicies, to take one example, ha, propose an answer. That's an answer. You may not be satisfied with that answer, right? I mean, that's the problem with theodicy is that can you find an answer that's just ultimately satisfying the whole way through? Um, various Christian voices have had an answer. Augustine had an answer, okay? These have all been answers all the way through. The question is, you know, do, you know what do you make of them? And, and to anticipate a kind of a final conclusion that I'll make, I don't think there's an answer to the problem of theodicy. I don't think there's a single answer that you can just trot out like a prize pony that will just give you what you want on this topic. Rather, I think as a Christian through scripture and through our tradition, what we're being offered 
is a kind of range of responses that can be applied in different scenarios based on the situation and based on the use of wisdom in a particular setting and within a community. Is that kind of response satisfying? Oh, so you're just saying it's just like this bewildering diversity of things and we just have to be sensitive and know what to do. Yeah, pretty much. That's exactly what I'm saying. So I'll expand on this in a later lecture, but I just want to slip this in here. Does the book of Job provide a final answer to theodicy? No, rather it ratchets up the drama. Although I think, like these other responses we've been looking at, I do think it does provide answers or an answer of its own kind. How we'll accept it and, and how it applies to our lives is another question, uh, another issue. But I do think it provides some, some answers. It provides a range of answers, really fascinating ones. Um, a little background on, on the book of Job in terms of its date, its authorship. Um, we don't really know who wrote the book of Job or when. Let's just leave it at that. If we had a kind of a, a course just dedicated to um, the book of Job, we could spend a lot of time going into an issue like that. I will just say that I, some, I often hear the claim made by people that the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible and was written in X, you know, some wild year B.C., I, I, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. Like there's no evidence at all within the book of Job or anywhere else that the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Um, we don't, and there's no evidence for its authorship of any kind. Um, we just don't know. Now we do know that the book of Job, its language, its Hebrew language is among the most complex books in the Hebrew Bible. Indeed, some uh, trying to translate the book of Job from Hebrew at points is really, really difficult. More than any other book in the Bible, it contains words that only appear in this book. So we can't really even compare the Hebrew words with other Hebrew words and other books. And so frankly, especially when we get into the middle of the book with its poetic passages, um, what we see, you know, is a good scholarly guess in some cases. In some cases, it's pretty clear. And in some cases, we can figure it out based on context. But Job is a tough book on the level of language, that's for sure. The book begins with a man named Job. Let me read from Job chapter 1, verse 1 and following. There, one, there was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. So right away, we have a characterization of a man that I think by the narrative flow, we're meant to accept. Namely, that Job is righteous and upright. Indeed, that word um, translated um, um, blameless in Hebrew, I mean, it means complete. You could even translate it as perfect. Can there really be a perfect person? I mean, what does it mean to be blameless? Even in the translation, I've been using the NRSV here. Blameless it means you can't blame him for anything. If you can't blame him for anything, that means he hasn't done anything wrong. Indeed, as we quickly find out in reading Job chapter 1, Job is not only so blameless that he doesn't have any of his own sins to make sacrifices for, to atone for. He is so righteous, he tries to even offer sacrifices for the sins his children commit, going to that level. And actually, it's not even quite that, as we're told in the text. Rather, in these first... Um, um, five verses, we find out that Job not only has no sins of his own, his children don't even seem to be sinning. He's offering sacrifices for sins he fears his children will be, will be committing in the privacy of their own hearts, okay? So this is a very bizarre family, Job's family. He's, apparently he's got a wife and he's got 10 kids living out here in this weird land of us. I'm not really told where that is or what that is. It's kind of a never-never land, a kind of fairy tale land in which to play out this drama of suffering and of theodicy and of righteousness. He's perfect. Seven sons and three daughters. Maybe we're to think that this ratio was thought in his cultural setting as a kind of a perfect ratio of children. Notice the way that the numbers of his sons and daughters also mirror the numbers of the, of, of the animals he has. Seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. It's almost like the very mathematics of breeding children and animals all work out to say, this guy is perfect. Nature responds to Job. We've seen this motif before, right? In Deuteronomy and, in, and, and elsewhere, um, we see this in the book of Psalms in various places, that if, if one, the book of Haggai was a good example of this as well. If, if a person or a community is righteous, the land itself will respond in kind. If I'm righteous, my garden will grow. If I'm wicked, my trees will die and produce no fruit. So you can see it, right? We talked about this in, in light of, uh, as well, in light of the Lisbon earthquake 
and our discussions in a previous lecture of just nat natural phenomenon. Does God send natural phenomenon down to strike people? Or is nature just completely chaotic, totally random, totally willy-nilly? In Job's world, it seems there seems to be a connection. And you wouldn't be crazy if you thought in this book that there was some kind of connection between Job's righteousness and his prosperity. He was righteous and upright. He had these daughters and then he has all this stuff. I mean, what are you supposed to think? That he just got rich for nothing? So this is the drama that then unfolds. We're, we're then taken from earth and swooped up to a, to a heavenly scene in which heavenly beings are presenting themselves before God. There's a particular heavenly being that in most translation is, is called Satan in verse 7 of chapter 1. Or really verse 6 and 7. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. Now there's a little footnote in my Bible correctly down on this word Satan with a capital S. Um, the footnote here in my Bible says, or the accuser, Hebrew, ha-satan. Indeed, the phrase in Hebrew is ha-satan. In Hebrew, ha is the definite article, the word the. And in Hebrew, by grammatical rule, you don't use the definite article ha, the, with a proper name. You could use it with a title or with a, you know, a, a class of beings or citizen or something like that. But however we translate this phrase ha-satan, it probably can't be translated as Satan with a capital S. That's probably a wrong translation. That's a, that's a traditional translation, but it's probably the wrong one. We might say the accuser. We might even question, by the way, as we read Job chapter 1, whether this accuser, this Hasatan, is actually really opposed to God in some cosmic sense, like Christians see Satan as being opposed to God cosmically. Um, rather, this character, um, Hasatan, ap simply appears among the divine beings, and the Lord speaks to Hasatan rather casually. The Lord says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on earth. He's perfect. Satan uh, answers the Lord, Hasatan, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a fence around him in his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed him, you know, stretch out your hand and touch him and he'll curse you to your face. Hurt him and he won't be like that. Tone is so weird in the Bible. The Bible doesn't give stage directions. So we're left wondering, like, what's the tone? Is this Hasatan character like very relaxed? Like, oh yeah, you know, is the tone more like, oh yeah, I've considered him. But you know, he's a pretty rich guy, you know. I mean, you know, people with a lot of wealth and health and stuff, you know, of course they tend to, you know, be very happy with their lives and they're very, they're very content to worship God. But, you know, maybe if his life was different, you know, he wouldn't be worshiping. And God says, oh yeah, very well, let's do this. Let's stretch, you know, stretch out your hand and let's, um, you know, let's hurt him. But, you know, don't kill him. Let's see what happens. Is that the tone of the conversation? If it is, should God be having this kind of conversation with the devil or a Satan figure? Of course, if you don't see this character, Hasatan, truly an interpretive issue here at stake, as that kind of cosmic enemy, you, you wouldn't have to see the tone as something completely adversarial. Okay. Anyway, this Hasatan character might be better read. Indeed, I think it's better read. You can read the book yourself and think about it. Better read not as the cosmic enemy of God, like this kind of horned figure with a pitchfork who's in flames, you know, not that character, but rather is something like a kind of divine prosecuting attorney, an angelic figure, you might say, who um, goes about the earth and does what a prosecutor does, looks for people like, like, like a prosecutor in, 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 a, in, a, in a country or a state or, or a city or something like that. They look for people to prosecute who's committing crimes against the state, bring it up to the judge and so on. God is the judge in this setting. So this is why they're having this debate. And, you know, this Hasatan character is like, look, I work in the prison system of the world, you know, as it were. I know how these people operate. I mean, come on. So there is some tension, certainly, between the characters, you know, or maybe Hasatan is accusing God of being naive. They do punish Job nonetheless. How does the reader feel seeing God being involved in this? Even, even if you say, oh, he's not really doing it, he's just allowing it. Okay, even so. Right here, though, we have theodicy implications. Let's say you do see the character here as Satan. You have then an image of God allowing certain kinds of suffering for God's own reasons. Reasons that in the book of Job are actually mysterious to Job. Job doesn't get access to the heavenly scene. 
which is pretty bizarre. He doesn't get to know. He's just he's just suffering in total ignorance of the fact that God and Satan are having this like divine bet over his health and life and fidelity, his faithfulness and his response. That and that's pretty crazy in and of its in and of itself. So Job's children all die in a horrible way. Indeed, they die in such a way, verse 13 of chapter 1, one day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. This is the thing that the, that, that the kids do, we're told in chapter 1. They go around in this circuit, really, you know, perhaps we're to think seven days a week, seven sons, seven days in a week. Is it a coincidence? They go in turn to each of the houses and have this feast. And this maybe prompts Job to do the sacrifices, thinking that, well, maybe the kids are, I mean, all this kind of partying, they've got to be sinning somehow, at least in their hearts. That's why I'll offer the sacrifices. So the narrator tells us that the very occasion on which the children die by this, um, you know, uh, horrible event, a great wind in verse 19 comes up and strikes the house down. I mean, pretty, pretty, pretty mysterious is on the exact occasion in which they're doing the thing, having their little wine feast, that Job feared that they would be punished for doing or that they would sin while doing. So the book almost seems to ratchet up the tension for poor Job. Not only does he not have access to the heavenly scene, his kid's death happens in a way that makes him think that maybe he failed somehow to, to you know, to provide the right kind of offering on their behalf, as if they shouldn't be providing their own kind of um, offerings for their own sins. I mean, if you saw someone suffer in this way, I mean, I know this is such a bizarre situation in Job that he would, that, that a person who's so rich would literally on the same day, and it's almost like comically related in the end of chapter one, that you would lose all 10 of your kids and literally all of your possessions on the same day, like within, in the same minute, you would be told of the entire thing, a total loss. I mean, you know, if, if there was someone in your life who lost like that, even if you knew that they were a good person, you might think in your head, like, are they being punished for something? Like, is this a divine action? Now, if you were Job's friends and you thought that, you would be right that it was a divine action or at least had something to do with God's the inner workings of the heavenlies because it actually does in the book. But Job doesn't know and nobody else knows. His friends come to comfort him. Um, and for seven days, they say nothing. They just sit in a, a total vigil of silence, which is pretty amazing. I mean, I don't know if you've ever sat with someone in silence, like for a long car ride or something. It can be kind of strange. But what about a day? What about seven full days? At the end of chapter two, we're told they sat with him, his friends who come to meet him, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar come to meet with Job for seven days. Sit with him on the ground in silence. Job himself breaks the silence. In chapter 3, with a very dark lament, he regrets that he had ever been born and he curses the very day of his birth. I wish it was darkness. I wish I, wish I, were, I, wish I was nothing. I wish none of this had ever happened. I wish I had never lived. Lament as a response to suffering. We see again um, that lament itself is a very common biblical response to, to the problem of evil. Horrible things happen. You cry out to God, even wishing you'd never been born. Disorientation and, 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 and the horror expressed in lament is a common faith response. It's not, it's not an act of unfaith. Lament is not the opposite of faith in the biblical vision. This certainly isn't true in the Psalms. It's certainly not true for Job, who is clinging to his faith and his belief in God and God's goodness, even through his lament. Rather, lament is an attempt to call God to account, to say, God, come and engage with me. In the Psalms, when the speakers say things like, God, wake up, or God, how long I'm hurting, there's an attempt there to get God's attention and bring God close. So lament is not sin, and to the extent that lament expresses doubt and expresses hurt, um, this is not the opposite of faith. Rather, it's like a, almost like a deeper, more holy version of faith, where you're going through something so hard and you realize God is your only way. And, you know, this is what I see Job as engaging in in chapter 3, even though his language is pretty difficult. Now, chapters 4 through 37 of Job, as you'll see if you read this, is a long argument between Job and his three friends. First, Job and the three friends, and then at chapter 33, I think, 
another friend, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 32 through 37 is yet another friend, a fourth friend kind of sidles into the, sidles into the debate after the fact and sort of gives his long speech. These speeches occur in cycles. So the friend will speak and then Job will respond and then another friend speaks and then Job responds. It just goes on and on like this. Now the friends come in and they say something amazing, which, you know, the friends have often been criticized by readers of the book of Job because of what they say to him. And what they say to him, as, as you now know, if you've been tracking with these lectures, they, they tell Job a deeply pious biblical message. Namely, Job, have you ever read the book of Proverbs? Have you read the book of Deuteronomy, Job? People suffer because of what they do. You're suffering really badly in a really uh, mysterious way here, Job. Come clean with it. Repent. Come back to God. You can, we can make this right. I mean, the first friend, Eliphaz, I'll just read a couple of his words there, here. Chapter 4, verse 1. Eliphaz the Temanite answered, If one ventures a word with you, will you be offended? But who can keep from speaking? We've been silent for a long time. We've got to talk now, Job. See, you have instructed many. You've strengthened the weak hands. Your words have supported those who are stumbling, and you have made firm the feeble knees. But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. It touches you, and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence and the integrity of your ways your hope? There we have that fear of God motif again um, that we saw also in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Verse 7 of chapter 4. Here it is. You saw it coming. Think now. Who that was innocent ever perished? Or when were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity so and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they are consumed. This, in, in many variations, is the response of the friends that you'll see as you read these chapters. Suffer, you know, it's the act consequence scheme. You get what you pay for, Job. You sowed into the earth some trouble. Some, you, you plowed in some iniquity. When you go to reap, what do you think you're going to reap? You know, you plant a bad seed in the ground, you're going to get a bad crop, Job. What did you do? Now, the friends are roundly criticized for this as a response in the face of suffering. How dare they? How, what, what horrible friends? You know, like, how could you come to someone and do this? I'll, I'll make a little quick argument in defense of the friends, though, on two, on two fronts. Number one, just like a social psychological front. The friends here come to Job in his time of suffering, and yes, maybe their message isn't perfect, but they are with him. And by attempting to draw Job into a narrative, namely the, the mainstream narrative about suffering in the Bible, they attempt to draw Job back into the realm of story and give his life meaning, where Job had tried in chapter 3 to literally erase all meaning from his life. In his lament, he had said, let my birthday just be wiped from the calendar. He wants to erase time and the story that is his life. Indeed, some of Job's language in chapter 3 is anti-creation language. And many scholars who have studied this language say, yeah, the author here is playing with language from Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, God says, let there be light. In Job chapter 3, Job says, let there be darkness. Yehi or, in, in the book of Genesis, let there be light. Job says, yehi hoshek, let there be darkness. He wants to reverse God's creation insofar as it concerns him. So the friends are playing a social role. They're bringing Job back into a story, trying to say, no, 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 don't die, don't die. Don't commit suicide. I mean, he doesn't mention suicide, but maybe they think it's a danger, who knows, that he just can't go on living anymore. So they do that, number one. Number two, the message they bring to him is a deeply biblical message, and you cannot deny that the message they speak is a biblical one, it is. You could say they happen to be wrong about Job sinning by the narrative of the book, and indeed that's true, but how are they supposed to know that? I mean, you know, they're in the dark. I mean, all they can do is be a friend and look in at someone's life. It sure looks like, on biblical terms, Job has done something terrible. So I don't know. As, you know, as you read the book of Job, maybe don't be so judgmental of the friends, but consider their arguments in light of what you know, or what you now know, having tracked with these lectures, about the basic act, consequence, nexus in biblical wisdom literature, such as the book of Proverbs, also in that Deuteronomistic trajectory in the book of Deuteronomy, and then onward through Joshua Judges, Samuel Kings. We do have, though, at our disposal by this point, at least in terms of our order of our lectures that we've gone through, um, the book of Ecclesiastes, 
which does have a message about suffering and pain that, that is a very discordant one that doesn't follow the act consequence scheme. So maybe there's hope here yet for Job that somehow he'll be able to get out of this situation without just being accused. But Job's fear, I mean, you can imagine it. What if he dies in this state of suffering? All that'll be left is for people to imagine that he had committed some horrible sin, some sin that was bad enough that indeed his entire family has died. So the book of Job is toying with us in a very dark way here and toying with our poor friend Job, whom we'll leave in suspense here as we close this lecture. He's righteous, but he's suffering badly. Something is happening to him that ought not to happen to a person. How is the book going to come to explain this? And how is the book going to, how, is, how could God explain himself? That he had been making deals with Hasatan or the Satan character up in the heavenly realm? Torturing someone in order, as a test of faith? Do we imagine our sufferings as a test in that way? Um, a story that comes to light here too, in this sense, um, a story may, maybe not often thought of in terms of theodicy, but one we might draw in, comes in Genesis chapter 22 with Abraham and Isaac. Abraham Long childless is told he'll have a child. He does have the child. And then he's immediately told as a test, the narrator says in Genesis 21, God came to test Abraham and said, sacrifice that only child. Why would God test people? What does God have to learn? If God is omniscient and omnipotent and just has everything, can God really learn anything about human response? Maybe he really can. And God's a contingent being who's not omniscient in a kind of philosophical way, who really needs to learn things about us and how we will respond. And God makes himself vulnerable in that sense. Maybe the test is merely for us. Although, as we know, some people die as part of their testing. It's not all like Abraham, where the angel comes in and stops the sacrifice. Or with Job, as we'll see as the book concludes, you know, there's some kind of happy ending. Or is it a happy ending? We'll have to come back and explore that. What do we make of this notion of testing then as a type of theodicy? It's maybe like the Stoic style theodicies in that suffering is not to be viewed as just something really even bad, but just part of the natural order and we can learn from it and we can become better people. Certainly that's a kind of test. But do the tests even work? Do the tests go too far? Has God gone too far with Job in this situation? With the friends attacking him, losing all of his stuff. And, and how can God really come, come and explain this? We'll have to tackle that in another lecture. So we'll end here for now. All right, that's all. See ya.